Hi, this is Shannon Steimel, and this is my mini conference of gratitude where I'm recognizing the educators who have influenced my thinking. And today my guest is Dr. Kristen Matson, who I first became aware of through the, her Facebook group, Future Ready Lives, that she started, and um, then got to meet in person at our Midwest Education Technology Conference last February. And I learned a lot from her about digital citizenship, and so uh, we'll be talking about that today. So uh, Kristen, I'll just let you introduce yourself and tell a little bit about uh, what you do. Sure. I am a high school library media specialist. You probably just heard the bell go off. It's passing period. <laughs> um, I work with 2,600 ninth through 12th graders and about 200 certified staff. And um, I feel like my job is just to be a servant leader and support those folks in any way that I can. So I feel like it's the best job in the world. Every day looks a little bit different. I have lots of flexibility to be creative. Um, and I just, uh, I enjoy coming to work every day, which is a nice feeling. So, <laughs> I guess besides that, I'm a mom, a really busy mom with two kids. Um, I love doing professional development. I work with districts kind of around my area to infuse digital citizenship into our curriculum. Um, luckily, I'm done being a college student. I got my doctorate degree back in 2016. So now all of my learning is just like free fun learning. Which that's great. <laughs> so um, the the book that you wrote that did that come out of your research for your uh, doctorate degree? It did. I um I researched basically digital citizenship curriculum in grades six through twelve. I took three major prepackaged curriculum. Um, it ended up being something around eighty different lessons that have been sort of packaged and put out into the world for middle and high school students. And I just kind of picked them apart in lots of different ways, looked for commonalities, differences, um, and sort of tried to define digital citizenship through these curriculum that we present to students. And um, what I found were a lot of gaps, a lot of inconsistencies. Um, and I struggled with the fact that digital citizenship was really just so nebulously defined through our curriculum. Um, and so I knew that moving forward beyond that work, I wanted to try to help teachers kind of see what digital citizenship is, see how it fits into the bigger picture of education, um, and offer them some really practical things that they could do in the classroom um, to help make students better digital citizens. So while I wasn't able to directly use anything I wrote for my dissertation in the book, um, it was definitely sort of those next steps where I wanted to so how would you define digital citizenship, Kristen? Yeah, so I think about digital citizenship as like an umbrella term that a lot of different skills fit underneath. Um, if I talk about traditional citizenship, I know that I need a lot of things to be able to be a citizen. I, want, I need to be literate. I need to be able to communicate. I need to be able to get along well um, in a community, understand how I can contribute to that community, what my place is. And so if we think about digital citizenship in the same way, um, we think about people as members of digital communities. I like to think about all of the different skills that we need to be able to be participants in any digital community we choose to be in. Um, so that is things like traditional literacy, uh, but it's also things like media and information literacy. It's that ability to communicate um, but not just traditionally in writing, um, it's being able to communicate in lots of different formats. And so digital citizenship to me is a goal, and we've got lots of different skills that we need to equip students with in order to really fully participate. And that, that definition really kind of expands the idea of digital citizenship from perhaps what some people would think of it as. Um, in fact, in your book and in your presentations, you share how, you know, a lot of the materials that are out there already on digital, digital citizenship are really fear-based. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that and why it's problematic? Yeah, well, digital citizenship has its roots in... Um, I don't want to get too deep and like turn all of you <laughs> off because I've been nerd on this for a while, but digital citizenship roots are 
are are um, were planted really back in like 2003 and 2004. Schools were um, really just starting to get on board with bringing information, um, computers, internet connections onto their campuses. And one of the ways that that schools and public libraries were able to do that was through federal E-rate funding. Um, you guys in education know that when we got money, it comes with strings attached. <laughs> exactly. So we're going to have the announcement. I'm so sorry. You're going to hear the loudspeaker. Can you hear me okay over the, the loudspeaker? You good? I can still hear you. All right. Anybody that's in a school gets it, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, this federal E-rate funding was awesome because it was set aside to help schools and public libraries bring internet access, bring computers into their programs. But the money came with uh, the situation that we had to protect kids from things that were sort of unsavory online, um, which is why we have internet filtering in most of our schools. And it also came with the stipulation that we had to teach kids about internet safety. And so the earliest writings about digital citizenship were really focused on what do we need to teach kids to be safe. Um, and it just kind of got stuck in that place of here are all the things that are unsafe about the internet that you need to know about in order to be safe. And I think we're just now starting to turn the corner and think about digital citizenship as something bigger than staying safe online. Yeah, you know, I, I think that for me too, that's part of why I asked you on today is because I feel like um, you know, a lot of my thinking about digital citizenship was more about, you know, like cautionary tales of what you <laughs> shouldn't do to make sure that you don't uh, end up, <laughs> you know, causing yourself trouble down the line with, with what you have out there online. Um, so I really appreciate you influencing my thinking to, to kind of get bigger picture on that. And, awesome. and I'm sure that's why ISTE uh, chose to publish your book because um, you. You know, they have a whole uh, <laughs> section on digital citizenship that touches on exactly what you're talking about. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> sure. I think the other big piece that we're starting to see swing is that, you know, for a while people got sick of like that cautionary tale message, got really tired of hearing all of the do not do's and we won the opposite way for a while. And there were a lot of people in education talking about the need to teach kids how to brand themselves, put out, you know, this really positive image so that when an employer or a um, you know like a college scholarship person was looking at your stuff, you would you would shine really bright. And I I struggle with that because it's still very like egocentric. Um, either we're teaching kids to protect themselves or we're teaching kids to brand themselves. And for me, digital citizenship is really about the possibilities of being in community with others. I love the fact that you and I have connected in life, Shannon, because we probably never would have without the power of technology. And I exactly. can say that about members of my PLN all around the country. Um, and so when we think about digital citizenship, I, I struggle with those egocentric messages. I really want us to start talking to kids about that power of community um, and coming together for something bigger than just ourselves. Yeah, you know, and, and trying to be more student-centered, I think, is, is a real focus of yours as well. And so yeah. I know one of the ways that you've done that and kind of entered into conversations with kids about digital citizenship is through images. Yeah. And so, um, you know, would you talk a little bit about, you know, why you feel that, that that's a great way into conversations with kids? Yeah, so many of the prepackaged curriculum that exists today um, are very teacher-centric. So the teacher either presents a scenario, shows a video, um, kind of gives kids a, a what if and asks them to respond to that. And there's some research out of University of Michigan. Um, they actually go into middle grade classrooms and they talk with kids about all sorts of digital business topics. And what they're finding is that on the multiple choice quizzes and tests, the kids know the right answer. Right, they know to bubble in, like, do not share my password with anyone. They know that that's the right answer on the test. But then, when you have conversations with kids, they've got all these um, sort of, I don't know, exceptions to the rule, right? So, <laughs> I know to bubble in, I know to bubble in, don't share my password. But if this is going to do it, it's like, well, you know, maybe I could share my password with my best friend. My best friend's not going to tell anybody. Or maybe I can share my password. My sister, because my sister really wouldn't tell anyone. Um, and so, what that research the University of Michigan is showing is that, you know, digital citizenship isn't just these black and white answer to test. There's lots of different gray areas that we need to explore with kids. So, I love images because it's 
allows for kids to have conversations around these pictures um, without having to be personal, right? So when I'm looking at the picture that you have on the left, the girl painting her face on Instagram, it's really easy to talk about how, you know, people put themselves out there as their best self or their perfect self, where on the other side of the screen, they might not be feeling as confident. It's easy to talk about that in generalities instead of having to get up in front of a class and say, well, guys, I'm really insecure, but you wouldn't know that from my Instagram page. Um, it also just gives an opportunity for kids to seek out um, and interpret these images instead of having to look into a teacher, sort of tell them how they should behave when they're online. Um, and images are, are really cool because you can do all sorts of things with them, from discussion and writing, um, the date, and your short bell ringer. <laughs> yeah. Instruction. Um, there's just a lot of flexibility with the use of images in the classroom. So, um, yeah, I encourage anyone who is interested in more about this to definitely visit your website because you've got um, mm -hmm. some great uh, lessons on there um, about, you know, with your discussion cards and um, a link to a Pinterest board that you've created that pulls these images together. So, uh, you know, I think they're really great. Um, you know, we have a local educator, uh, Julie Smith, who uh, also presents a lot about digital citizenship. And one of the things that she points out that I think is is really interesting is, um, you know, the a lot of the issues that that kids face with technology aren't the typical or traditional cyberbullying that you know one mm -hmm. might have thought of um but you know it's more subtle than that like you know a, a subtle snub from a friend um or mm -hmm. you know the pressure to get more likes or to have a have streaks with with your friends um you know that that's mm -hmm. actually what more kids are worrying about so um, you know, when you start listening to teens talk about their digital lives, what do you hear from them? I hear a lot of the same things that Julie talks about. I think there's also this pressure to be um, in the know. I think back, like, I don't know, probably 15 years when every Thursday night on TV was like must TV, must see TV night. And we would sit around and we'd watch Friends and Seinfeld and ER and on Fridays <laughs> at school or Fridays at work, everybody was talking about what happened on Friends or Seinfeld the night before. And if you had watched shows, you were a part of that conversation, you were in the know, you could, you could participate. Um, and so much of the viral content that's shared now is sort of like that must-see TV of this generation. Um, I think that, I mean, I see it all the time. We've got a group of four kids kind of sitting around. One of them is talking about some crazy viral video that, you know, I think is probably kind of silly. But for whatever <laughs> reason, they love it. Um, and then you've got the one kid that just hasn't, hasn't seen it yet. And they can't participate in that conversation and they're confused and, and the other ones are like what are you kidding me you haven't seen this yet and they clue him in but it becomes a way to I think, connect with others offline as well um, it's a way to talk about a shared experience a shared viewing experience um, so I do think there is that pressure of kind of staying in the loop um, and knowing what's going on with pop culture and so much of that pop culture now is happening through social media sharing versus happening through you know scheduled television shows that you and i would sit down and watch when we were younger um but yeah i do also see these conversations about oh my gosh i texted so and so and i haven't heard back from them in an hour and you know what does that mean did they lose their phone do they hate me what's going on yeah. um and a lot less a lot less of the like you said sort of quote unquote cyberbullying where someone is deliberately causing harm to others um, and I think that goes back to needing a shift of curriculum um, because we don't necessarily address some of those social and emotional pieces that come out um, as much as we address some of those big do not do's um, like cyberbullying. So Kristen, one of the things I love about your book is that, um, you know, it, it it changed my thinking, but it also just has a lot of really practical tips of how you can do this. And, you know, as librarians, of course, we're concerned about it. But, you know, I think one point to take away, too, is that this is not just the responsibility of the librarian or the technology teacher or, you know, the counseling department, um, that every right. teacher should be a teacher of, of digital citizenship. So um, could you just share a few ideas of of how yeah. educators can incorporate um, digital citizenship into their curriculum? 
Sure. I think that the best way to do any sort of education is through authentic opportunities for learning. And so when you do just invite that guidance from here into the classroom for 20 minutes out of the school year, digital citizenship becomes this like super nebulous, weird thing that nobody owns, um, but everybody kind of has to do. When we are putting kids into digital communities, whether it's four kids collaborating on the Google slide or it's a whole class in a, um, I don't know, like a Google community talking about the books they read, we have opportunities there to teach kids how to be a participant. Um, so we can have discussions with them about what do we want our digital community to look like? What are some rules that we can all agree to? What are some norms that we can all follow? Um, being able to model what uh, both positive posts and what um, like constructive feedback can look like in digital spaces is huge. I love hearing stories about teachers that are collaborating across classrooms. Um, the teachers are able to model what the digital interaction can and should look like um, between the two of them. And then the students have tutors who are kind of guiding them through those things. And so looking for opportunities to just your time to practice having good conversations online, I think is vital. Um, one of my favorite parts of the book from a lot of people are the sentence frames, and I was on a page number, I don't. Um, I, I've actually put together a couple different pages of sentence frames that can help guide students as they have dialogue online. We tell them all the time to be nice online, but oftentimes people don't know what that looks like. I think it's perfectly okay for us to have disagreements when we're online um, because I think that's how we move forward as a society is, is by disagreeing and having conversation. Um, but I think that there's a respectful way that we can do that. And so there are sentence frames in the book that kids can use almost like a fill in the blank um, sentence where they can say, hey, I appreciate your point of view, but have you considered this point of view? Um, or another sentence frame might say something like, hey, I love that idea. Here's another idea that kind of adds one to it. Um, and it really is just like a clear cut model of how we can engage in dialogue that is respectful, even if it isn't, um, you know, just patting each other on the back all the time. So I love that piece. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, I really You're appreciate welcome. your time on this. And since this is uh, my little gratitude project, I thought I might give you the opportunity mm -hmm to pay it forward and, and just say uh, a little something about someone that you're grateful for that's changed your thinking and, and either yeah, in citizenship or just in education. Um, can I pick three? <laughs> <laughs> sure, go ahead. Because <laughs> okay. um, they're kind of a dream team. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to um, Mark Ray, Shannon McClintock Miller, and um, Britton Follett because I feel that the three of them are doing amazing things for school librarians and they're doing a lot of good work around the country and pushing forward this idea of librarians as true instructional leaders. And um, I'm just really grateful to all three of them for continuing to find ways to include me in that conversation and allow me to um, kind of continue to spread my work through different conference appearances and opportunities like this. And so I'm just really grateful for the three of them, their teamwork, um, and what they're doing to kind of shine a light on all the awesome work that school librarians have been doing forever. Um, but now everybody gets to see it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, if you haven't joined the, the Future Ready Live space group, group do that, uh, you know, and then also um, there's just a lot going on with webinars, like you said, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, so definitely check, check out the Future Ready framework if you haven't um, already, um, and particularly the work around the libraries um, and follow-ups. Uh, is it projects? Commute, Project what, Connect. Project Connect, yeah. So that, that kind of started, I think, before uh, the Future Ready move, and then they mm -hmm. kind of connected it connected it in. So, yeah, that's great. Well, thanks yeah, again. Just comes oh. Oh. Did I lose you? There you uh, are. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. Okay. <laughs> what were you saying, Kristen? I said I thought I lost you. Um, no, they're just, they're doing some really great work. Lots of great resources on their site. I was just agreeing with you. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to say goodbye then. Thanks again for your time and for uh, what you've done to, to help me uh, think newly about digital citizenship. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much. You have a great week, Shannon.
<laughs> Thanks. You too. Take care.